This meeting is being recorded. All right. Sorry, let me fix my gallery. There we go. I can see myself. Well, hello. My name is Antoine Dandridge. I'm the founder of Black Lifestyle Advocates for Culture and Knowledge. Uh, organization of Planned Parenthood established in 2020. This is our second cohort, and tonight we are very excited to um, present the Black Action Council a conversation titled "Who Is Margaret Sanger?" And this com this is a, a really um, nice recollection and presentation on a very controversial past uh, history of our founder Margaret Sanger that um, has been sort of an elephant in the room. And today we're going to sort of actually embrace the elephant in the room so that we can have a conversation. So uh, this conversation is definitely meant to create a space that we can uh, be able to have a healthy conversation about something that was very critical and somewhat offensive, harmful, and painful for a lot of folks because we are in a place where we're ready to move past history, make new history, and not let this be a deterrent to the work that we all know as uh, reproductive justice and rights. So uh, without having said that, I would like to move forward in the presentation. Uh, but first, I really want to acknowledge our amazing cohorts for doing this great work. Um, so you're going to expect to see a presentation that has been curated by these three amazing fellows, Ashley Jones Lacey, Reverend Frank Johnson, and Keyshawn Pearson. And they're going to have a lot of great news and updates and just a whole bunch of good things that they're going to talk about today. So I really hope this is beneficial and a great educational experience for all of us involved today. And we can move forward. All right. So again, a controversial legacy. Who is Margaret Sanger? This is part one. Uh, so yeah, we're looking forward to this. And let's go next. our leadership team. I would not be here today if it wasn't for these amazing folks. Uh, myself, Antoine Dandridge, as I previously said, Arian Blanchard, our program coordinator who actually works directly with our fellows week over week and worked directly with me in terms of the program design, management, and implementation. Kayla Collins, who is our uh, coordinator for the, uh, well, the graduate, uh, graduate associate, a policy coordinator. Then we have uh, Kaylin Bailey, who is our community engagement and Black organizing intern. She's also a graduate student at the University of Memphis, uh, receiving uh, her degree towards a Master's of Social Work. So she's definitely one to look out for in this social justice realm, as well as social work. And I'm proud to present all of us as a leadership team. These people are all amazing. Next slide, please. All right. So I definitely want to make sure we revisit the mission and just in case you have not attended a black organizing event our mission is to a uh, black organizing which stands for black lifestyle advocates for culture and knowledge organizing fellowship program is to hold a safe space for black community activists and supporters to engage on issues and ideas relevant to the black community we engage we advocate we learn we embrace freedoms of black people of black people opinions and ideas for greater knowledge to advance the progress of black culture we celebrate Black lives every time we engage. We hold ourselves accountable as advocates for all Black lives in one safe space together. Deal? All right. So I think we all in agreement with that. Next slide. And I'm actually going to call on Kaylin to uh, read our vision. I'm sorry, some of this stuff is blocking it. So let me move it up. Okay. okay. Black Org Organizing Fellowship, the, the vision statement. The vision of Black, Black Lifestyle Advocates for Culture and Knowledge Organizing Fellowship Program is to expand the capacity to organize, engage, and empower Black communities around the issues centered around reproductive freedom and the intersectionality of, I'm sorry, Black lifestyles. Thank you so much. I believe after that, we'll uh, have a few housekeeping rules and we just want to make sure we're cleaning and using the right utensils and uh, sponges and our mops and all this type of stuff because we want to make sure we're keeping this thing in order. Um, so definitely make sure we just keep respect, you know, forefront of all things that we do. Let's actively listen to each other, keep some good energy, and we're going to just speak on it, y'all. Uh, this is a, a safe space for us to have a conversation like this and we hope to 
make this a good one. Next slide, please. All right. So again, we're going to have an introduction of our fellows. Um, I would like to call our young Blanchard, you know, to the forefront to give a nice warm introduction of our fellows before we head into their presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. So I would love to introduce our wonderful fellows who, like Antoine mentioned earlier, I work with directly on a pretty daily basis and have come to really love and respect. So we have Lacey, uh, sorry, <laughs> I went backwards. Ashley Jones Lacey, um, who is our registered nurse um, and reproductive um, fellow. And then we have Frank Johnson, who is our environmental justice fellow. And then Keyshawn Pearson, who is our economic e equity advocate fellow. I'm adding pins as we go. So we'll see them all. And we're gonna start the presentation off with Ms. Ashley Jones Lacey. Hey everyone. Um, I'm gonna jump right in and get to some background history on Margaret Sanger. Um, just to let you know a little bit about her. So we're going to build up and talk about her life and um, just kind of give you some background about her just in case you're not familiar with her. Hopefully you learn something new. Uh, again, my name is Ashley Jones Lacey. I'm a Reproductive Health Education and Advocacy Fellow. And um, I'm going to jump right in. We thank you everyone for being here. So Margaret Sanger was born Margaret Louise Higgins in 1879 in Corning, New York, to Irish Catholic, Irish Catholic parents. Um, her father later became an atheist, and he was an activist in women's suffrage. Margaret's mother, um, she actually was a homemaker. She conceived 18 times, and she gave birth to 11 children. Margaret was the sixth of those children. Margaret's mother died at a very young age, at the age of 49 years old. Um, she died of tuberculosis, but because of her history in um, childbirth and having conceived so many times, her body was frail. She was not able to um, sustain, so that's what caused her death. Um, in 1902, Margaret married William Sanger. He was an architect and a painter, and Margaret um, gave up her education and became, became a, um, a mother to three children. In 1911, uh, fire destroyed their home, and th that the Sanger family fled New York, and they went to they fled uh, where they were, and they moved to the suburbs of New York. Their Sanger worked as a visiting nurse in the East Side slums, and her husband worked as an architect. The couple became activists in social politics. She joined the Women's Committee of New York Socialist Party took on labor actions and industrial workers of the world. Um, and they became involved with local intellects, left-wing left artists, socialists, and social activists. Sanger was prosecuted for her book, Family Limitations, under the Com Comstock Act in 1914, which banned conversations around sex toys, contraception, anything of that nature. Because of this, um, Sanger feared for her safety, so they fled, her and her family fled the U.S. and went to Great Britain. But her work with this book actually contributed to the legalization of contraception in the U.S. Sanger believed that abortion should be a viable option um, in cases of saving a woman's life, but um, in the best way to prevent back alley abortions. But otherwise, she thought that abortion, abortion should be avoided and contraception should be promoted. Um, additionally, population control was a, a major concern for Sanger. She believed that overpopulation led to famine, war, and poverty, and that was another reason why she pushed birth control. In 1921, Sanger, Sanger founded the American Birth Control League, which later became Planned Parenthood Federation of America. In New York, she organized the first birth control clinic staffed by all female doctors, and later she uh, founded a clinic in Harlem, which was 
black led by black advisory council and black uh, workers as well. Margaret Sanger made a speech to the Ku Klux Klan Women Auxiliary in Silver Lake, New Jersey in 1926. And um, she also was an advocate of eugenics theory. Um, and eugenics is the theory that society can be improved through breeding desirable traits such as intelligence and industrial industriousness. Um, in the early um, 20th century, excuse me, um, the eugenics idea was very popular, especially among white Americans. Margaret Sanger pronounced her belief in alignment with the eugenics movement um, in the scientific journal, Birth Control Review. At times, Sanger tried to argue that eugenics wasn't uh, applied based on race or religion, but a society that's built on the belief of white supremacy, physical and mental fit is being linked back to being based on race. And that's it for Sanger's history. Awesome, thank you, Ashley, that was amazing. And so now that we've learned a little bit about Margaret Sanger's life, I want us to explore the time she lived, learned and experienced through the policy and legislation of that time. So first we'll start with legislation, uh, federal legislation, and then women's rights legislation, and then finally uh, civil rights legislation uh, during her lifespan. Uh, in the 1871, the Ku Klux Klan Act was passed. Uh, they were a group created by Tennessee Confederates who were documented for killing and terrorizing black families across the United States. Uh, so much so that they had to invoke the power of the president of the United States uh, to enact uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act in 1871. Another prominent uh, piece of legislation was the Rutherford B. Hayes Act, uh, which was passed two years prior to Sanger's birth. Um, it's also known as the Compromise of 1877. It pulled federal troops from the South, uh, leaving the South um, as it was defined in the history books as in the hands of the Confederates who were previously slave owners. In 1907, Sanger was about 21 years old when the first law was passed that was based in eugenics. Uh, and it was passed in Indiana and known as the Indiana Sterilization Law. All right, and then let's see. After thousands of lynchings uh, from enactments of uh, Ku Klux Klan Act to the failure of the bill on lynchings uh, in the Senate in 1918, uh, that then Sanger would have been 28 years old. Now, women's rights legislation uh, would have started as far back as 1769, uh, where um, in the, let's see right here, the colonies adopted uh, an English system that decreed women cannot own property of their own name, or they couldn't, and they couldn't also uh, keep their own earnings. Um, by 1900, uh, Sanger would have been 21 years old. And by that year, every state had passed legislation that granted married women the right to keep their own wages and to own property in their own name. Sanger was also a part of women's rights legislation in history in 1918. Uh, she would have been 39 years old when she won her suit in New York that allowed doctors to advise their married patients about birth control for health purposes. Um, and then finally, in 1965, she would have been 86 years old when the Supreme Court established the right of married couples to use contraception. Now we move to civil rights. Uh, during the time period that Sanger lived through, uh, you, she would have uh, been entrenched um, in a world shaped by Jim Crow laws. So the Jim Crow laws, as many of us know, um, but is defined in history as segregation uh, legalized segregation is segregated waiting rooms and buses and restaurants and other public spaces. The Jim Crow laws were an expansion of the Black Codes. The Black Codes basically uh, determined where enslaved people could work and for how much they could be compensated. And so uh, in that time is the time that uh, Sanger would have been going to school, would have been creating her ideas um, and building her organization. Uh, she would also see three civil rights acts passed that were in place to create and assist 
um, and protecting opportunities uh, for Black families um, and those other communities of colors that have been displaced uh, and disempowered. Sanger lived in a time where legal precedents were uh, created and implemented to disempower Black people across the country, to terrorize them and resulted in killings. Uh, she lived into a time where newly minted laws fought to give all people, Black communities included, uh, unmitigated access to voting. Uh, she would have been 86 when the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed um, that would bar literacy tests and poll taxes. Um, so she lived through a lot um, and, and that shaped uh, not just who she was, uh, but also her organization. Frank Johnson. Take it from here. All right. Uh, the lingering legacy. So we both we all know uh, somewhat the history of eugenics and people like Margaret Sanger. Um, what we don't understand a lot of times is just how their work and their research and these um, beliefs that they created out of these programs actually shape what Black people are dealing with now. Um, most of their work actually fed into the myth that Black people could endure more pain or that we didn't have uh, feelings at all. Uh, we also know about the history of the so-called father of uh, modern gynecology. Uh, I think his name was uh, J. Marion Sims. You know, he experimented on uh, Black women, uh, on slaves. And so we have a tendency to leave out how this legacy is with us today. So on this uh, PowerPoint, I've uh, put up some PowerPoints about, first of all, the life expectancy. Uh, African-Americans, of course, comprise 13.4% of the US population. So our population has pretty much stayed the same uh, for the last several decades. Um, the second one, African-Americans are also living longer with even, with, uh, even healthcare insurance, but we still don't live as long as white Americans. Uh, we also know the uh, discrepancies in uh, childbirth among black women. Uh, one of the examples that I do wanna use, um, the example of Serena Williams when she gave birth to her, uh, to her child. Uh, even though um, you know, we all know who Serena Williams is, we know her popularity world, worldwide, even she, with all of her status, because a lot of times when we talk about these disparities, uh, we don't talk, we only talk about the uh, so-called uh, low-income people, but this extends to every class of Black people, because Serena Williams, even with all of her popularity, all of her wealth, she still had to instruct the nurses and give the nurses a hist her own history of having blood clots. And because why? Because Doctors and nurses we know do not listen or do not believe Black people and in particular Black women a lot of times when they're explaining their pain. Uh, so this extends to every, um, all across the board when it comes to Black people, this disparity. Uh, this disparity. Uh, because what we understand is that the Black body in this paradigm of white supremacy is just an instrument. Uh, they can use us to experiment, use us to entertain, use us to do whatever they want to, and then dis discard us uh, as they see fit. So we still see this legacy on today. We can go even further when we talk about um, uh, the um, uh, experimentation from Tuskegee, how that was able to go on for so long. And then as far away as Flint uh, in our modern times, even here in Memphis, Tennessee, with our lead and contamination issues, uh, a lot of times black communities are located near contamination sites on top of landfills. And it doesn't matter again, which class that we consider ourselves a part of. Uh, one of the communities, um, uh, the community that I'm from, the Alcee Ball community is just one of uh, three other sister communities that were affected for almost uh, 80 years by the defense depot. Uh, if you go back to the 1950s, the 1960s, even the 70s, uh, Castalia, for example, was one of the premier middle-class black communities. Uh, and here it is laying in the very face of a contamination site. Uh, the Alcee Ball community, my community, was one of those uh, communities as well. So this type of thought process does not end when, you, when we talk about uh, low-class black people or, lo or low income. It is across the board. And so these things actually originate uh, with people like Margaret Sanger because they put it into the public narrative that Black people are somehow more resistant to pain or that we're not human at all. And so that's where all of these things actually come from now. Even if we want to talk about going into um, the political sphere, 
Um, we've had a, a man named Ed Buck, who is a primary contributor to uh, the Democratic Party out in California. Uh, he's been caught with, I think, three, uh, the bodies of three gay black men in his house. He was allowed to do this twice. And I think the third time he tried to do it, uh, the guy actually survived. And he's just only recently been convicted. But it took the death of two gay black men and attempted murder of a third to actually bring charges on him. So what we continue to see in this is that our bodies are not our own. We are used a lot of times and then discarded. And next slide. All right, so the elephant in the room is what we're calling this. Uh, this is actually a quote from uh, Margaret Sanger herself. I admire the courage of a government that takes a stand on sterilization of the unfit and second, my admiration is subject to the interpretation of the word unfit. If by unfit means the physical or mental defects of a human being, that is an admirable uh, gesture. But if unfit refers to races or religions, then that is another matter, which I frankly deplore. Margaret Sanger, 1934. Um, we have some quotes here that we are we're gonna talk we're gonna go over today, but tomorrow we're gonna get more um, into the discussion about these quotes. So we just kind of want to give them to you today, and kind of think about them and come back tomorrow and really let us know what your thoughts are. Um, so the first one is the ideology of eugenics is inherently racist and ableist, um, and. I just want to give a little backstory. So these quotes are actually um, from Planned Parenthood Federation of America that they put out regarding Margaret Sanger, her history and all of that. Planned Parenthood denounces Margaret Sanger's belief in eugenics and condemns the irre irreparable damage these beliefs cause to the health and lives of countless people. And then the last one here, Margaret Sanger's racist alliances and belief in eugenics cause ir irreparable damage to the health and lives of countless people. At times, Margaret tried to argue for eugenics that was not applied based on race or religion. But in a society built on belief of white supremacy, physical and mental fitness are always judged based on race eugenics and therefore is inherently racist. Next slide, please. Margaret Sanger was so intent on her mission to advocate for birth control that she chose to engage with ideologies and organizations that were explicitly ableist and white supremacist. In doing so, she undermined reproductive freedom and caused irreparable damage to health and lives of gener generations of Black people, Latino people, Indigenous people, immigrants, people with disabilities, people with low incomes, and many others. Planned Parenthood values the fundamental freedoms of all people to control their bodies, their lives, and their futures. We will work every day until full health, dignity, and self-determination are a reality for everyone. Planned Parenthood is committed to interrogating our structures and processes to address how racism is still at work within our organization and movement. Awesome. Okay, so right now, <laughs> you heard a lot of information uh, and uh, there's a lot to process. So we want to pause, have everybody take a deep breath um, and write in the chat kind of what you feel in this moment. As, as we're processing in the uh, chat, I think this is also a good time to even name, like if you've even heard of this information before, uh, many of you may be very familiar with Planned Parenthood, but did you know about Margaret Sanger or did you know about Margaret Sanger history? Um, were you aware 
of uh, that this uh, history that she was a part of was also deeply impacted our movement over the years, especially when you talk about being black or brown. Um, I don't know if many of you ever talked to some of the maybe older people in your family, but you know, older, you know, black women push back on Margaret Sanger and like Planned Parenthood uh, establishments because of the history. And there's such a deep history with trials, um, medical trials that was very hurtful and painful to black women that was mentioned actually in this project. Um, but there were some of those sterilization projects and things that happened to people that we know, people who are still living today who was actually impacted by that, um, basically went to you know doctor visit to have a, a medical exam and was actually sterilized without um, permission. So um, this, this history runs really deep. But also the purpose of this conversation is that um, folks who try to uh, persuade people to not, you know, stand for, you know, abortion or advocate for abortion to a certain degree, use this information as a way to uh, change the narratives for those of us who have different, you know, beliefs and ideas about it, in particular around Black people. So a lot of times the, um, the race card, in a sense, is kind of pulled, but on the flip side, you know, there's many organizations that was established in the 1800s. Many organizations have shared leaderships, visions, and ideas. However, we still have a responsibility as people who represent these organizations, people who represent the different freedoms that we should have. Uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that this history doesn't repeat itself and to make sure that we are clear about the fact that it happened and that um, we know what we could do with our future moving forward. So as we are going through the chat, just want to see what anybody have. Let me see. Uh, of course, Keisha, I know about the history. If you want to. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So we have, let me scroll up just a little bit. Thank you guys for your input. I know for me, like, even being involved with this project in this moment, I'm still kind of like processing. So <laughs> I can understand it's taking y'all a minute to, <laughs> to say something. It's kind of a lie. Um, so we have um, Miss Betty. I don't know how to say your last name properly. And it says, had no idea who she was and her impact. This is very insightful. Um, yeah, you can elaborate that on that if you if you want to. Thank you for that. Um, so I have um, Justin that says, I didn't know about most of this history at all. It's interesting that in the culture wars, um about abortion uh, i don't see this historical argument mm. <laughs> thanks for the knowledge right and that's exactly the point that antoine was just making at the end um when people you know the signs and the anti this and the pro-life and all that then you don't you don't see the his this history presented and that's very interesting and advantageous i think um and then kishan says um honestly kind of shocked definitely uh enlightened right like you know when you be what is it what they say when you become the teacher you become the student so i think all of us became educated in this process i know i did and um like i say i'm still like processing um so i would love to hear if anybody else has any more thoughts um feelings too. share feelings like is are, are you speechless are you upset are you informed um what else do you guys uh feel and thank you for sharing it for everybody that did. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Miss, I see Miss Betty says, I appreciate the tone of the discussion, recognizing her contributions and highlighting the impacts that we are still fighting. Thank you. I'm sure the fellows appreciate that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm not sure if we have any people who volunteered for Planned Parenthood before or uh, people who have actually participated in advocacy. Um, it's one of those type of uh, situations that once you learn how to explain it, people kind of look at you a little differently, but they also honestly can have a real conversation with you because at the end of the day, when um, when any, when a person decides to have uh, an abortion or to come to Planned Parenthood, uh, all of those personal experiences are totally unrelated to you know the history. However, again, it's always important to not run away from history and like the impact that it's made, but to address it, because again, as future leaders, as future advocates, we need to be clear that we don't want to repeat this again. And I think we can all agree with that here. Um, so yeah, so keep that chat going. We're going to continue on with this part of the presentation and uh, see where we land. But thank you all for definitely um, participating to, with us today in the chat. So definitely keep the chat going. All right, let's go. 
All right. Well, join us tomorrow. We will have a part two uh, town hall conversation. Um, that conversation is going to be an awesome time for us to actually turn our cameras on, meet each other, and just really uh, we can have a review of a few things that we talked about today and just kind of open up the floor for some conversations. Um, if you know people who have always talked about the conspiracy theories of Barbara Sanger, the eugenics, you know, which at the time I think it was also mentioned in this presentation, it was kind of part of an era. Thank God we I wasn't born. None of us were born back in those days, right? Um, it will be a tough time to have to really um, be a part of a, a political, politically landscaped America while being someone who's a black didn't want you to be here and be part of the, the movement. Also tomorrow, we're gonna have a very special guest by the name of Christy Taylor. If you're from Memphis and remember uh, some of our gospel radio stations, some of our adult urban AC stations, Christy Taylor is pretty much the voice of Memphis, you know, for many years. And so Christy now has her own uh, channel, uh, Christy, Christy Taylor Online, which is on Facebook and Instagram. And we're so excited that Christy's gonna be here with us on tomorrow to, uh, to really moderate a conversation so that we can have this conversation and also if we need to have this conversation again we can look into that too because it's already down on the record just a matter of bringing more people to having that conversation so if you have any organizations or groups that um, would like to be a part of this conversation please let me know um, my email is not only on the flyers but all of you have received emails from me feel free to reach out if you have questions about the fellowship and our upcoming events but don't forget us don't forget to join us tomorrow for the town hall conversation on Margaret Sanger. We must have this conversation. Yes, Justin, I agree. We must continue to have these conversations and feel free to ask any questions that you have when you come and join this conversation at any time. This is a safe space for us. Okay. So it looked like we are, what's the next slide? I'm not sure what's behind this slide. All right, well, this actually tomorrow's presentation. So we'll start here tomorrow so we can go back to the last slide um, do we have any questions? Um, in fact, I'm about to get ready to end the recording so we can have a close discussion if you like for a second. And thank you so much again for joining us tonight. We hope this presentation was informative and enlightening. And before we uh, end the recording, I'd like for us to give a, a silent or a, a loud round of applause for our fellows for their great work. This is a major contribution to the movement. We could not be more grateful for you. You guys worked so hard. Thank you to the leadership team who was supportive. Uh, Ari for your direct mentorship with this team and uh, me for coming up with such a great idea. I have to pat myself on the back too. Thank you so much. And we are gonna pause your recording y'all.